So today I'm going to visit to my parents and I'm going to be installing this new Hive Active Heating System. So I bought this for them ages ago but I've never had time to put it in so we're finally doing it. So what we'll do is we'll show the actual product itself, we'll install it and I'll do a whole sort of video on the whole installation process. thought it could be quite useful. So the one we went for here is the heating and hot water variant. They do two, they do one that's heating and hot water and one that's only heating. Here they don't have a combi boiler, they've got a conventional system with a tank, so they need the one that has hot water. Which is a nightmare getting this, because I bought it from Amazon in their like Black Friday sale, that's how long ago I bought this. And they sent me the wrong one and then wouldn't return it, it was an absolute nightmare. But yeah, so I finally got the right one. This is the high heating and hot water. See it around the side, it just yeah, shows features. And on the back, this is the full kit, so this includes the thermostat, the receiver and the hub. Not all the kits include that, so you need to be careful when you buy these because you can just buy the thermostat on its own, which is useless if you don't have the other parts. So that, yeah, this comes with the thermostat, that's the remote thermostat part, the receiver that connects to the boiler, and then the hub that connects to the network. And the other reason I went for Hive is that it works without the hub, so it can work as a standalone device without the app control, which means if there's ever an issue technically, or you know, the, my parents just want to quickly control something, they can use the thermostat, they don't have to use the app. And yes, that's the kit there. So what we'll do is before we go into that, we'll take a look at how the sort of system we're installing it into. We'll come back and look at the hardware, and then we'll go and install it. So now here's the system we're installing it into. So this is the boiler, which is a Weizmann Vitadens 100. Don't know, it's put in in what, 2009, so it's not too old. But yeah, it's not a combi boiler, it's just a conventional system, so we've not got, we have to have the hot water control separate. So that's the boiler there, and then over here there's, there's the existing controls. So it just, they're just using one of these very standard lifestyle LP5522 LP controller things, which is like fine, but it's just, it's in a cupboard, it's a pain to control, it's one of those things you've got to like press a million buttons to try and set the times on it. So we'll be replacing this with a Hive Hub, or not a Hive Hub, the Hive Receiver, and then it just fed through this FCU before, so I'll take this apart and try and sort the wiring, because it's, I don't know how good it is, and like, it's cracked there, so that'll need, to, I'll replace that back box on it. And then, the cabling's going to be interesting because there's all these cables that come out of it. That black one goes to the boiler and then these two twin and earths go down under the floor and I think there's a wiring centre hidden under the floor with pipes and the pumps and stuff. So I'll need to try and go and find that. Um, so that'll be an interesting adventure. But yeah, so that's what they've got in here. And then for thermostat control, they've got this thermostat here, which we don't even know if it actually works. It's always just set to the maximum setting. But to date this, I mean, it's painted in, but to date it, the temperature's in Fahrenheit, so that's how old that is. But it is still wired in. If we go into the cupboard next to it, around here, there's this twin and earth that comes out the wall, so I suspect that comes from the thermostat. So it is potentially still wired in, so we need to go under the floor and try and find where that's wired in and disconnect it. If I couldn't find the wiring centre, I could just cheat and like cut this twin and earth here, put a junction box on the end and just link it out, and that would almost essentially just have the thermostat permanently on. But I'd rather take it out properly and do it neatly. And that means my mum can actually pull that thermostat totally out. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to actually try and find that under the floor and see if that's wired in. But yeah, that's the current thermostat they have here and that will be getting totally removed and the hive will do all the thermostat control instead. Which makes a lot more sense. Cool, so now before we actually go and install it, we'll take a look at what, what it comes with. So, open the box. So here you get the thermostat itself. So that's the actual wireless module that lets you control, it has the actual controls and everything in it. So, Comes in batteries, which is good, just takes double A's. And then under there, that's the high thermostat. So that's got the screen, the buttons, and the knob, and all that sort of stuff. It comes with a wall bracket, so you can wall mount it. And there's also a separate tabletop stand you can buy, so you can just stand on a table, which I think ultimately we'll end up getting here. Next up, you've got the hub. So this is what connects to your router. So you plug that into your router and that lets everything wirelessly be controlled from the app. So a little thing there. On the back it's just DC in, Ethernet, and then a USB port, which I presume is just uh, you know, designed for added features. You, you, you don't really use that. And then it comes with an Ethernet cable and a power supply, which is one of those bizarre ones where they've put, uh, given you a USB power supply and a USB cable, but it goes into a DC jack on the thing, but that's fine, that works. So yeah, that's the hub, and then finally, you get the dual zone receiver. And this is where it comes down to the difference between the hot water models and the ones that only work with a combi boiler. This is the dual zone receiver, whereas the other ones only have a single zone receiver. 
So this allows you to connect both the hot water and the heating, as you can see by the two buttons. And if you're buying these secondhand where all you've got is a picture, that's the way you can tell. The dual ones have the hot water and heating symbols on them, whereas the single zone ones only have the heating symbol. And that's there, so you mount the back plate on, wire it in, and yeah, that's all you need to do. So yeah, now we just need to go and try and install this. So the first thing we're going to do is disconnect this thermostat, just because that's probably the hardest thing, and I just want to make sure I definitely know where it's all wired in. So the cable comes in here, through the wall, and then comes down and I presume goes under the floor. So I suspect you'll have here there'll be a wiring centre somewhere under here that will be connected to the thermostat we connected to. So I need to go and find that and then disconnect, link out where the thermostat was and then rip it all out just so it's essentially permanently switched on where there would have been the thermostat. So I've already turned off the spur for the boiler but I'm also going to turn off the circuit breaker for it too just so that's definitely off and I'll be checking that, I'll actually be checking with a meter on the wiring centre just to check it is definitely dead. Because this is quite an old house, it's like from the 60s. So, you know, who knows what state the wiring is in, who puts heat, heating in, how it's all wired. So I'm going to be extra safe and make sure I definitely check it's all isolated. Because the thing is like, you know, you look here, there's a circuit breaker which is labelled with a question mark. So, that's exciting. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll definitely be checking it's all dead. Um, and obviously goes without saying, don't do this unless you actually are confident enough about your knowledge of electrics and of the property you're working in if you don't actually if you have any doubts consult an electrician or a proper installer but yeah so that's off now we need to descend into the abyss under the floor to try and find this wiring center because that's the only place i can think of it being and i know that under the kitchen here there is like the water pump and the valves are under the kitchen so hopefully i can go and find it so yeah this will be fun and don't expect the best video quality when i'm trying to film in pitch black but yeah time to try and find that wiring center and i'll be back hopefully Okay, so now under the floor with all this like graveyard of old bits of heating and pipes and God, goodness knows what. It's a bit of a nightmare under here. It's like, you know, 1968 house. It's like, you know, who knows how much work's been done here over the years. But I've put in the thermostat. So up here, you can see there's that hole and there's this bit between the earth that comes through there and runs along this joist off the side. That's the thermostat wiring. Apologize for the noise, someone's going to tap upstairs. Um, that then comes along here and into a junction box. Now, I was expecting a nice little wiring centre, but then I came across this thing. So, yeah, that's the issue with this place. Like, you know, who's done the heating here? It's been, you know, it's probably wired in like the 60s and it's been bodged and changed over the years. So it's all a bit of a nightmare. So you can see there, this is obviously the wiring centre because the valve there comes into it. And then there's those two, that's the pump there. That there goes off to something. I presume that'll be maybe like the tank thermostat upstairs. Um, and then there's those bits to the earth. One of those will bring the feed in from the FCU, one of those is the thermostat. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna have to do a lot of deciphering of what's here. But what we can see is the thermostat is coming into this junction box here. So what I can do is essentially if I open this up, I assume there'll be something sensible inside and I can just link out where the thermostat used to be connected. Um, this is a bit of a nightmare though, so I'll probably suggest they either replace this or like get an electrician or someone to actually come and like replace this, this with something properly because that's there and then oh it opens as well and then over there is also another junction box that's just dangling i don't know if that's to do with the heating or if that's to do with the um like sockets i actually don't know so yeah but <laughs> this is a bit of a nightmare but hopefully i can at least link out the thermostat and then potentially get them to actually look and, look and get this fixed properly because that is pretty terrible. I mean, that's, I think that's an old MK, like, back box with blanking plate, like, out of the 60s. Like, that looks like the stuff that was original to this house. So that is probably from the 60s. So, yeah, that definitely needs a bit of a change. Um, but, yeah, hopefully at least I can link the thermostat out and we can replace with something a lot nicer later on. Okay, yeah, so this is an absolute state. So I have checked this is all dead. It's, you know, it's isolated multiple points. I've checked on the meter and just checked that this is absolutely dead, which is good. But my God, what a mess this is. Like, yeah, they need to get this properly rewired because this is just horrific. And you can see also there's a lot of new colours in here because this has been, like the pumps have been replaced fairly recently and the boiler's been replaced. And they've just, every contract that they've had in has just kept this. Like, you know, the, it's, the house since this is put in has probably had like three or four new boilers. It's had... This pump was apparently replaced last, or valve was apparently replaced last year. 
the pump's been replaced. I definitely know that that's been replaced a few times. But they've always kept wiring into this thing. So like, yeah, this definitely is replaced. But that's the thermostat wire there. And it comes in and it goes to a junction box there that connects off to the valve. And then the other neutral comes from the boiler and goes into here. So all I'm just going to do is just link this out. I'm just going to link the two legs of the spirit's thermostat where, where, well, link where it went out to the thermostat and came back and just link them together just to bypass it totally. And that will get the thermostat out. It can then be removed. And then we'll get, we can continue with the hive installation because that's all done upstairs where it's all kind of modern. And then we'll get this whole sort of system completely replaced. So yeah, I'm just going to take, take the, the thermostat out of these two terminal blocks and connect this wire into this terminal block here just to essentially bypass that old thermostat. But yeah, this needs a full rewire for at least for the heating anyway. I mean, there's also a pipe here that's tied up with earth sleeving, which is delightful. So yeah, like I'm not a plumber, but the, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the, the plastic ties, tying things up with bits of wood in between. Yeah, it's not good. And the scary thing is like, my parents didn't do this DIY. They got plumbers in. They would have hired reputable-ish you know, plumbers to put this sort of stuff in. And this is the standard that they've left, which is horrific. Um, but yeah, I'll link this out and then I can get out from under here because this is not fun. Okay, so I'm digging into this even more and it's quite terrifying. So this is the junction box. So I've linked out the thermostat. I just took those two cable wires that went out to the thermostat and linked them together to the Wago. And that connects the cable from the programmer upstairs that signals for the heating to come on and connects that to the valve that switches the heat, sends water to the radiators. At least that's the best I can see. I've also replaced all the earth with this Wago just because they were all like, literally there was multiple terminal blocks cascaded together to try and connect all the earth. So I've done that a bit better there. But this whole thing is going to need replaced. So I can't do it right now because all the shops are shut, but I'll probably actually either replace this myself or get them to get an electrician and sort this because this is just an absolute disaster. And the worst thing I found is this bit here that connects the neutrals all together. That these were literally not even screwed in. They were like twisted. There's one wire screwed in and these were like twisted round it, but not actually caught under the screw at all. So that's not being connected properly. Like, yeah, it's bad. And I still don't actually know what this, this white wire goes off to. I think it maybe goes up to the boiler, but I don't actually know. So yeah, it's pretty bad. So I'm going to need to dig into this a little bit more, but yeah, I'm going to at least fix these, replace these with a Wago, just to get decent terminals and I'll come back and replace this whole thing. But at the very least, I've linked out the thermostat. Right, so I've fixed this now. I've just sort of, well, I've temporarily just sort of made a temporary fix. So I've replaced all those dodgy terminal blocks that weren't holding the wires properly with these Wagos. And the main thing here is I've just linked out that thermostat. And then I won't be doing it on this video because I've got to go and get the part, but I'll come down and at the very least replace this or get someone else to come and replace it because this is obviously not really acceptable. But I'll get the top back on this. I'm going to do the more interesting bit, which is actually replace the hive itself. Because hopefully if you're installing hive in most houses, you won't have to deal with this sort of mess. So now I'm back from the depths of hell under the floor and that thermostat's now removed. I can now look at replacing all this. Now obviously that stuff under the floor it is a mess. I've made it as good as, as best I can, but I will actually go away, get a new wiring centre and replace that. I've actually gone, sort of worked out how the whole system works and worked out how it's wired and determined it's a gravity fed system. So now I know how it's meant to be wired, I can quite easily replace that. So at this point I call this a gravity fed system after some looking online to try and work out what sort of system it was. And my mum saying that she thought it was a gravity fed system, like she'd heard, heard plumbers say that before. But looking into sort of diagrams of gravity fed systems online, it doesn't quite line up. It seems to be, it uses the same control mechanism as a gravity fed system and you do need to put the hive into gravity fed mode, but it doesn't seem to be gravity fed. The best way I can describe it is this diagram here, where the boiler feeds a pump and the pump turns on irrespective of, of if you want hot water or heating. So the pump is also used to feed the, heat, the hot water system. There's then a valve that opens if you want the heating. So when it runs in hot water mode, it will just pump hot water around the system up to the tank. And if you put it into heating mode, it will do the same and heat the tank, but it will also open a valve that routes water around the radiators. It would be interesting to know if this does have a name or if this is actually a gravity fed system, but it uses a pump to feed the hot water tank, so that doesn't sound like it. So it would be interesting to know, yeah, if this, is, if this has a name or if this is just something some plumber in the 60s or 70s or whenever this was put in dreamt up and put it in himself and you know designed it himself because it's, it doesn't seem to match anything I found online. But at least the hive system does does support gravity fed systems, which then mean it can control a system like this as well. But yeah, it's definitely a bit dubious. 
and being a gravity fed system we'll actually take a look at that with Hive. What that means is the way this works is the heating programmer here has the two lives out of it, one for switching hot water on and one for switching heating on. But with the way the system works, the heating, the hot water signal turns the boiler on and heats the tank and the heating signal turns that valve that sends water to the radiators. So the programmer itself needs to be aware of this so that when you turn the heating on, it also turns the hot water on automatically. And Hive does support that, so we'll take a look at that setup later. But what we'll now do, it'll take a look at replacing all this sort of stuff. So I've kind of determined, figured out how, how all this works. So one of the, this twin earth here comes from the consumer unit and that's the permanent live to the FCU. Out of this FCU, you've then got this black flex that powers the boiler and this three core in earth that goes down to that wiring center, if you could even call that meta wiring center. That carries the, per the switch lives for the heating and hot water, as well as a neutral and an earth. So that goes down to that box there. And then this flex here is that other one that was coming out of that wiring center. And that goes back up into the boiler so that when the hot water is switched on, that just basically links through within the wiring center and signals the boiler to turn on. Now, I don't quite know why that's been done there and you know, hasn't just been connected into the stuff here, but whatever it works. So what I just need to do in theory is just replace this. So all I actually need to replace is this programmer, but I'm going to actually take this um, FCU off as well and just replace that back box because it's cracked. So I'll take all this off. I won't do it all on camera, but I'll just remove it, remove this FCU and replace the back box. And then we'll take a look at how we're going to replace this programmer. Okay. So before I replace all this, I'll take this programmer off and we'll take a look at behind it. Just to sort of show roughly how it's wired. Now, if you're doing this yourself and you're not replacing the back box, I mean, just I'd take that off, there's a screw in the bottom lifts off. But if you're not replacing all this, all you would really need to do yourself is take your old programmer off, work out what wires do what, so you'll have a, program, a wiring guide on the back of the old programmer, and just determine which of these are the permanent light power into this, which of these are the switch live for the heating and hot water, and then just kind of replicate that onto the hive. So that's what I'll be doing. But what we've got here is we've got, this is that three core in earth that goes down to the wiring center. So the neutral is just linked onto the neutral coming from the incoming feed. Then that's the live to power the programmer because this is the mains power programmer. And then out of it, you've got this brown and this black. These are the hot water and heating signals. So if you look at the back of this, we can see the numbers. So that says that hot water is the, is the brown and heating is the black. Now that should really be sleeved, so I don't actually have any sleeving on me, but I'll just put a bit of brown tape around that just then and replace it with sleeving when I get some. But yeah, so what you want to do is when you take the old one off, just make sure you label everything. And also pay attention to the um, like normally open and normally closed. So we can see here that we are on terminals four and uh, three and four, which as you can see are normally open. So you can see like three is normally not connected and four is also normally not connected. The other two are normally closed. So again, just rep make sure you note that down, work out what ones do, what wires are doing what. So when you go to put the hive on, you know how it's wired. Because the risk would be if you took this totally off, ripped all the wires out and then went to put the new one on, if you don't know which ones do what, you're going to have a bad time trying to go back and figure out how it's wired. But yeah, so all I'll do now is I'll replace this FCU and then we'll come back and fit. I'll, well, I'll take this off, labeling up the wires, replace the FCU, and we'll come back and install the hive receiver. You know when you just see something and you just go, what were they actually thinking? I mean, that's me with this entire install, but it's just stupid things like this. So you'll see here, we've got this twin on earth is the power to the programmer and this twin on earth carries the signaling out. That makes sense. But then there's this random neutral, this blue wire, that's not just single cable. It just comes through the back box and connects neutral. And I'm looking at that going, wait, that's weird why they have that. But they've got this twin on earth here. So this is literally a piece of twin on earth with a neutral in it that they've cut short at that end and the other end, and then they've afterwards run this other bit of neutral in. Why not just use the twin and earth? And you know, use that blue wire there rather than cut it off at both ends and then put another one in. See, there's just stuff here that makes no sense. Um, I'll replace that, I'll just replace all that and actually put a, you know, a new bit twin and earth in, but what were they thinking when they did this? Like, I just don't get the thought process of some of the people that put this sort of stuff in. But anyway, that's another little quirk, this thing just, the gift that keeps on giving, oh, and not sleeve that earth, of course they wouldn't. Um, yep, fun. Yeah, and here's that bit twin earth, now I've removed it, and as you can see, yep, they've cut the neutral off at both ends, and then added another one in. So I have absolutely no idea what the guy that put this in was thinking. I think the answer is probably they weren't thinking, but you know, yeah.
Okay, so now sort of the SCU, just put the same one back on, but I've put a new back box on. And I've rooted the cables on the side rather than the bottom just so they don't snake quite as badly. It's still not ideal, but it's better than it was, sort of working with what I've got here rather than having to change a lot. I've got the two cables coming out the top, so what I've got is now I've got the twin in there that powers it, so that's just live and neutral to power the hive, just to the hive to power it. And then we've got this three core in earth here, and that's the neutral and the switched live for the heating and hot water that goes down to the wiring centre. So what I now need to do is mount the hive. Now, this is the hive receiver here, and if we take the bottom off, you remove those two screws and the bottom pops off, and it gives you a plate that actually looks exactly the same as that old controller. So you've got these terminals on the top and they're all labelled. So the manual labels how to wire it up, but since you've got live and neutral on the left, and then you've just got the same combinations like switch live for the hot water and heating, and then normally those, normally close and normally open contacts there as well. And earth terminal just because it doesn't need to be earth, but you can just stick them all in there. So I just need to mount this up here. Now previously it was mounted like right here, right at the bottom, and that looks quite neat, but the problem was that this has screws on the bottom that you need to be able to get into to unscrew it. So if I put this right there, you wouldn't be able to actually get into those screws. So I'm just going to nudge it up a little bit, not too far, but just enough that you could still use a really short screwdriver or like the head of a screwdriver for like a drill or something, just to like adjust those screws. Just so I'll put it a little bit higher up, and it won't be quite as neat, but at least it'll be easier to maintain. So yeah, I'm going to get this mounted up, then we can wire it in. So I've now mounted the plate here, and I've brought the cables up and stripped them. So that should be quite easy. Sit them back and then wire them in, which I'll do next. The only thing you need to do is if you want to bring the cables in surface into this, because you can bring them through rear entry, but if you want to bring them in on the surface, you have to bring them in the bottom and then just break this little bit of um, plastic out just to give a little gap and then that fits through a gap on the outer piece that clips over it and lets you run the cables in surface. So it'll just be like that. That'll be quite neat. Okay, so now I wired that up. So it's fairly neat here. So you've got the twin there that comes in carrying the power. So the live goes onto the live terminal, the neutral goes onto the neutral. Additionally, on the neutral, I've also got the grey core out of the three core nerf that goes to the wiring centre. That carries the neutral down to there, so I've put that in and it's leaved it blue. And then to carry the signal for the heating and hot water to switch on, I've got the brown wire into here for the hot water and the, the black wire, which I've just put brown tape round into here for the heating. I didn't have any brown sleeving, so I've just used tape for now, but I can get sleeving later. And then the earth's all going to this block, this terminal here. And yeah, it's okay. The only complaint I really have is these terminals are a bit dodgy. They're not dodgy, they're just a bit of a pain. Essentially, it's like a screw that goes through a copper plate, and then when you screw it down, that copper plate squeezes against the wires, which is fine. But the problem is that the cutout between these bits of plastic is slightly wider than those copper plates, so it's quite easy for the wire to slide up and hit and sit against this plastic. So you screw it down, it doesn't get caught under the plate, and it kind of stays in place, but isn't actually connected securely. So when you're doing it, you just kind of need to deliberately squeeze the wire against the screw when you're tightening it, and then it tightens in fine. So that was a little bit of a quirk, but it was fine. That's installed there. So now that's all wired in there, we now just need to put the receiver on. So this will just clip on easily, so it's there, just, just go on, clip, and then just push flat. And that's it installed. And all I need to do underneath is just put those screws in, which, even though it's quite close to the FCU, I can just use like a bit out of a screwdriver and just manually do it by hand, which is... It's fine, and it made a bit more sense doing that than trying to put it miles high up the wall and having it look even more silly. So, yeah, it's a bit fiddly, but that'll do. So, just need to get the other screw in, and then we can finally power it up. Okay, so it's all now wired up, the front's on it, so we can try it out. What I've also done before I've done this is I've turned the hub on. So I've connected the hub to the router with an Ethernet cable and turned it on. When it first turned on, it started flashing the green LED, which means it's starting up, and it did that for probably about 10-15 minutes, and it turns out that that's normal. And I think it's probably because it was doing like some sort of firmware update because it had been sitting in a box for so long. So it took quite a while to do that, but after a while it changed and started flashing an amber LED with a green LED on solid. And that in theory means it's now ready to pair. So we can now start switching devices on. So we turn on the FCU here. That'll fire up the boiler, but it'll also turn on the receiver. So yep, that's coming on there. So what I'll now do is I'll just wait for the boiler to quieten itself down and we'll try it out. Cool, so that's gone quiet. So in theory, if you press the hot water button here, yep, that'll override it on, and the boiler will fire up. So yeah, it seems to be working. And if you press that again, in theory, it'll do a little sort of countdown period just to give it some time for some reason, and it'll turn the boiler off again. So that seems to have worked. So it's still flashing orange, which I presume it means it's still trying to connect to the hub. But what I'll do now is I'll go away, and we'll try and connect the thermostat up. Okay, so now here we've got the thermostat, so I've got that here. 
So you just put the batteries in. So I've put most of them in, so you just put the last one in there. They all go in the same way, which is a bit weird, but whatever. And then click the back back on. Uh, that way. Well, this is something my mum pointed out, is that this battery release tab, like that flips up, flips up to release the battery, sticks out the bottom, so you can't stand it up at all. Now, they sell a tabletop stand, so cynical side of me would say that that's probably to stop you standing it like that. Because otherwise, if I had a flat edge, you could just stand it like that, but you can't. So that's just something to bear in mind. But yeah, now it's brought up this installation menu, so we can hit English, tick. And it says pairing. Oh, there we go. So yeah, it's now fired up. So, in theory, it says, let's take a tour. Press back button, skip tour. Let's just skip the tour. Welcome. So yeah, it seems to be on now. So, heat, hot water, all these settings. So, yeah. That seems to be working. And yep, it's come on there. So that looks quite good. Did I got the correct correct time? Yep, it's got the time automatically, so it must use NTP and the hub must do that. That's really neat. And I've also just noticed at the other side of the room, the receiver has got a green light on it. So in theory, this is now all connected up. So as you can see, that's it now working. Or at least for the hot water. Now, as I mentioned before, this is a gravity fed system which means it has a slightly different control mechanism. So rather than the switched lives coming out of this indicating heating and hot water, the heating one indicates to direct water to the radiators and the hot water one di directs to turn the boiler on. So it worked for hot water when we demonstrated it before, but now let's try the heating one and see what happens. So if we press the heating button on top, set a, te set a target temperature, then hit a tick, there's a click and the light comes on for the heating but nothing else happens because what this has done is it's adjusted the valve down under the floor to direct the hot water from the boiler to the radiator but because it hasn't then also called for hot water the boiler stayed off so this obviously won't work however with, Hi with Hive we can actually fix this we just need to switch this receiver into gravity fed mode and this will then behave correctly so when we call for heating it will also call for hot water now obviously you need to just know what type of system you have this system here is gravity fed, I kind of figured that out by like asking my parents how it worked. My mum mentioned that you can only have heating and hot water, you can't just have heating without heating the water as well. I was able to dig into it and look at the wiring and work out what it, what it was. But without that, you just kind of need to work, know what sort of system you have. But to switch into gravity fed mode is fairly easy. You just need to turn off the power to the receiver, then turn it back on again after waiting a few seconds, and then hold down the hot water button and you'd hold it down until the LED comes on blue. Just keep doing that, keep waiting. And as you can see, it's now turned blue. So that now indicates we're in gravity fed mode. And it'll stay like that, that will stay blue. And if you turn it off and on, it'll stay blue. So if it's blue, it's in gravity fed mode. And if it's green, it's in fully pumped mode. So now that's set up as, gra as a gravity fed system, if I were to boost the hot water, so if I do hot water boost tick, as before, the boiler fires up and only the hot water light comes on. Now if we cancel that, that will turn off and go to flashing, and then once that's finished flashing and it's gone off again, we'll come back and we'll try the heating, and hopefully now the heating will work correctly. Okay, so it's now turned off again. But now we're in gravity fed mode, let's try and turn the heating on now and see what happens. So if we press the heating button on top of the thermostat, let's boost the heating to a high, higher temperature than the room, press tick, and there you go. So what you'll now see is the heating lights come on, but the hot water lights come on as well. And that means we've not only adjusted the valve to route water to the radiators, but we've also signaled the boiler to come on, and that's now starting up. So that's worked. So that's how you can switch into gravity fed mode if you've got such a system. So yeah, that's basically everything installed. I've now essentially got the basic version working. This is going through the hub. I can use this, I can now cancel the heating as well. Heat boost cancelled, it's turned off. And that all seems to basically work fine. So all I need to do now is set up the app. I probably wouldn't bother doing that on camera, but apparently all you need to do is sign up with for the app and the account, enter the code off the bottom of the hub, there's a code printed on it. That'll then connect you to the hub, and then you'll be able to use the app to control it. So there you go, that's all working. So. As I mentioned at the start, I won't be going to the app control stuff in this video, that's a separate thing. You need, uh, you need to all set it up and put the hub in and set up accounts and stuff. Um, you know, there'll be other better videos of that. This is more just sort of show the actual hardware installation side of things. But yeah, it's working. So if you wake that up, you can set a target temperature, you can go into here, 
pick your heating hot water. You can pick if you want it on a schedule, manual or off. I've got the heating off right now. Um, you can also have things like your schedule for the hot water, which was set up. So you can go into the schedule. You can go into the schedule. View the current schedule and you can see the schedule it's set up. So it's all quite neat. The only real couple of complaints I've found with just the hardware of this part is that if you're using it handheld or on a stand where you're going to pick it up, these buttons on the top, the boost buttons, are really easy to accidentally pick, press when you pick it up to the extent I've actually managed to switch the heating on just by picking it up and handling it. Now, if you've got it wall-mounted, you're not going to have an issue there. And obviously, if you're using the app long-term, that's not going to be a problem, but it's just worth bearing in mind. And the only other real complaint I've found, well, two other complaints, are that the men is it times out really quickly, like the screen turns off really quickly, like as you can see there. That's understandable because it is battery operated, but I would rather it you could set it in settings, which you can't, because I found when I was trying to explain it to my parents and show it, you'd you'd be, you'd be pointing at like an, an interface element and it would turn off, and you're like, no, stay on. I need to actually keep this on the screen to explain this. So that was a little bit annoying. And then the only other real one is just this knob is a little bit finicky, like it sometimes jumps. Like it's one of those knobs when you position it over a button and you go to press it, you can accidentally skip it to the next or previous one when you're going to press it down. And that when you go to press it, you have to press dead in the center. If you press on like the outside of it, it doesn't detect that you have to press on the center. So the button's a little bit fiddly, but it's okay. And yeah, obviously if you've got the app control set up, you won't need to use this at all. So yeah, it's quite a nice device. It'd be interesting to use this and try other sort of competitors like Nest and see how they compare. Because this interface seems a little bit simpler, but it's not as slick. It does seem nice though. So yeah, that's that now installed and fully functioning. So there you go, that's it all installed and working. So we've got the receiver installed here, the hub connected to the router, and then the thermostat connected to everything, and it all seems to work fine. And yeah, the installation was actually okay. Especially on the Hive side, there was no real problems. Apart, the only real complaints were just those terminals and that receiver were a little bit fiddly. But yeah, it's fine. The fact that you can easily configure it to work on a gravity-fed system was a really good feature because when I discovered it was gravity-fed, I had this sort of fear moment of, wait, does Hive support that? But yeah, it does. It works fine. So yeah, the only installation issues I had were just due to the very, very dubious wiring in this house that I'll need to then you know, look into or get someone to come and fix because yeah, that wiring centre is not really up to standard. But yeah, it seems like quite a neat system. And it'll be interesting to like once I get the app control stuff set up, see how that works. But yeah, apart from a few minor complaints about just the knob being a little bit fiddly, it seems it does seem pretty like a pretty decent solid system. And the fact that it does work like this standalone with a really easy interface is quite good as well. You don't have to rely on an app, you can just use it as a standalone thermostat, which is quite a nice feature. You don't have to have it connected to the internet, which is quite nice. So yeah, there you go. Thank you very much for watching.